Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Mary Jiang, president of the Oakland Rotary Club. Founded in 1908, we're the third oldest club of some 36,000 Rotary Clubs in over 200 countries around the world. We're a diverse community of 270 business, professional, and community leaders who unite to serve our local and international community through our commitment to service above self. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our 5,410th meeting in, on Zoom. For over 114 years, we have welcomed Rotarians and guests to our club meetings. If you are a visiting Rotarian or guest of a Rotarian, please enter your name in the chat box located at the center at the bottom of the screen so that we can recognize you in a few minutes. If you have a comment or want to ask a question of the speaker at the Q&A session, please use the chat box to enter your question for the Q&A session. We recommend you view today's meeting using speaker view, located in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And now, Rania, well, would you please give us a thought for the day? There it goes. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. So honored to join you this Thursday afternoon, pre-Veterans Day. Just came from a beautiful veterans um, celebration with our elders in Oakland. So just want to honor that. And really briefly, um, I had a, a lot of Rotarians ask about the Coat Drive. Miss President Mary and our community service committee gave the go-ahead for that. So that'll be going out in our next newsletter, but we will start collecting coats, scarves, um, sweaters, new or lightly used. And this year we're gonna donate the coats and the winter wear to um, DA O'Malley's Family Justice Center, which serves families um, in need. So I'm really excited. So you guys just get ready. So when we have our in-person meetings to bring your coats and your winter wares to go to families that are very much so in need because we're definitely gonna have a cold winter. And now for our thought of the day, and I normally don't really agree with everything um, Dr. Cornell West has to say, but this um, quote really stuck there for me. It says, if your success is defined as being well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference, then we don't want those successful leaders. We want great leaders who love the people enough and respect the people enough to be unbought, unbound, unafraid and unintimidated to tell the truth. Thank you so much, Ms. Mary. Well, thank you, Renea, for that inspiring and thoughtful quote, thought for the day. Okay, I like, please join me in reciting the Rotary Vision Statement. Together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and in ourselves. Thank you. Welcome to visit our club, past district governor and past president Ed Jellen. Do we have any visiting Rotary guests online? Hello, uh, President Mary. Here I am reporting from uh, Oakland Rotary TV again, and uh, happy to be back in our TV studio in terms of uh, Guests or visiting Rotarians, uh, Brian uh, Vegby uh, checked in, and I'm not sure uh, which uh, he is, but uh, he's very welcome, and we're happy to have him here at our meeting. Uh, other than that, uh, my pad here is uh, fairly blank. So uh, <laughs> nice to be here, and uh, uh, good to see you all uh, via Zoom. All right. Thank you, Class District uh, Governor and Past President Ed. Um, again, everyone, thank you for joining us online. So we always welcome people to, to join our Zoom meeting or in person. All right. Um, Renia mentioned about Veterans Day earlier. So tomorrow, November 11th, is Veteran Day. So normally we would honor and recognize Rotarians who have served in the military and have a guest speaker who is a veteran to, to talk at today's meeting. Unfortunately, our speaker that we have uh, contacted is not available until next week. 
So we decided to defer observance of Veteran Day to November 17th, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, so now I'd like to have the privilege of inducting our 11th new member of the Oakland Rotary Club, Mary Heckle and her sponsor, Keith Uriate. Keith, would you like to introduce Mary with two interesting facts about her besides having the same name as me? <laughs> <laughs> President Mary, fellow Rotarians and guests, today um, I have the pleasure of introducing our newest Rotarian, Mary Heckle, who um, is the CEO of Highly, which is a nonprofit child care subsidy agency in Alameda County. Originally from Potomac, Maryland, she attended John Hopkins University and has a master's in mental health. She worked at Google for 14 years and was the first Mary to work at Google. Um, Mary was an instructor at the Arthur Murray Dance Studios. She taught mm -hmm. singing and dancing. This included the swing, cha-cha, and yes, Isaac, the salsa. <laughs> Mary's passion continues to be singing and dancing. Please welcome Mary Heiko. Thank you. Great to be here. Okay. So Mary, um, you will receive a red badge, which signifies your status as a new member. You will also receive the four-way test which guide Rotaris in their daily lives as follows. If we can pull that up, I will re we will recite it. But, so the four-way test is, is it the truth? Is it fear to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? And will it be beneficial to all concern? That's the model that we want uh, Rotarians to act whenever we do think, say, or do something. Okay. Also, um, next week, November 17th, I hope you will come in person because I have a goodie bag to give you. And inside this goodie bag has a handbook called Rotary Made Easy, which provides useful information about a club and also a roster with your 270th newest best friends, including me and Keith. So you will also get a rotary pin and I maybe you can't see it, but I'm wearing a rotary pin. And wear this pin proudly because you can attend any meetings in any rotary club around the world because they'll recognize you as a Rotarian. So that's what the pin looked like. Well, sort of. And finally, you'll also receive in this goodie bag a centennial book written by our very own Linda Hamilton, covering a hundred years of rotary history. So your commitment as a new member is to attend meetings like in person or like today on Zoom, participate in service, community service activity, contributing to the Rotary Foundation and Oakland Rotary Endowment. So it's my pleasure to and privilege to induct you as a new member, newest member of the Oakland Rotary Club. Let's give Mary a warm welcome by clapping, waving, snapping, Welcome. <laughs> All right, thank you. So moving on, Jason Weiserman. I understand you want to do a reintroduction of one of our Rotarians. Please. You understand, you understand correctly, President Mary. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to speak a little quickly because I am in a very small, tight uh, three minute window here and you guys know me, that's hard for me. So here it goes. I'm going to be chatting up our very own Rick Baskin. Four things we know about Rick Baskin, musician, attorney, human, and fellow Rotarian. Been a member since 2005 and he is quite a prominent member of the Cerrone Lena Scholarship Committee. All right, next slide, please. Our man was born and raised in Hayward, California, the youngest of three. That's his mom and his sister, he says. Uh, that's sister Carol and his mother's Millie. And his brother is um, Steve. Whole family, except his mom, graduated from Hayward High, go farmers. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, when Rick was six, his parents divorced and uh, Millie raised them all. 
Um, next slide, please. Uh, the teen years, very, very awkward. Music runs in the family. Rick's father, Leonard, loved jazz and played piano. His brother, Steve, played guitar. They actually were in the Baskin Brothers Band for quite a while. Rick dabbled in piano and trombone. And at age 16, found the love of his life, the harmonica. He also caught the acting bug, took a lot of acting classes, and appeared in school plays. Uh, he attended Antioch College in Ohio for a time and then dropped out and moved to Boston for a year where he continued his acting studies. Uh, Rick transferred to UC Santa Barbara, go Gauchos, and switched his focus to political science and made the decision to become a trial lawyer. And that's why you now see this new slide, so I won't tell you to change it. Fun fact, Lustaga Tats How'd I do, Rick? Uh, Rick speaks fluent German. That right there was a fun fact. Um, he spent a full year as an exchange student uh, at the age of 23 in a German university. All right, so law school grad. I don't know where we are now in the slides, uh, but okay, you can move to the next slide. See how that goes. All right, let's go back to the other slide, the previous one. So you're in the right place. You just moved too fast. Okay, good. Rick moved on to law school at UC, uh, at, uh, University of San Francisco, go Dons. And after graduation, he worked for three years as a deputy DA for San Joaquin County trying criminal cases. In his spare time, he joined a theater group, the Stockton Civic Theater, and as art imitates life, Rick played Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird in the play. After leaving the DA's office, Rick worked for a decade at a prominent law firm specializing in plaintiff's personal injury cases, and in 98, Rick hung up his own shingle and worked for himself. Next slide, please. Meditation, look at his back. Of course, it's a very, very relaxed back. That's because at age 18, Rick was introduced to meditation and yoga. He began studying it in earnest in 2005, joined a meditation group, which he's still in, and he loves to do it because it helps him stay grounded. We're learning so much in such a short period of time. Can I get to the next slide, please? Adventures. Look at my man. He loves to travel. He's done so extensively. No time here to list all the adventures. However, I can tell you that one of his favorite places to visit is the island of Capri in Italy. Next slide, please. This is a big one for me. Oh, he do. He do. Here's the culmination of a life well lived. That beautiful woman is Janine, the greatest thing Rick has ever done. Mary Janine, after being together with her for 10 years, they just celebrated their one year anniversary in August. I think it was mid August, August 15th. Um, they love to travel together and they're planning to go to Egypt next month for Rick's 70th birthday. All right, next slide, please. And here's the beautiful part of Rick. My man plays the harp. The harmonica, as Rick says, is my close friend, a part of me and always in my pocket. Rick's been blessed to share the stage with such luminaries as Maria Moldar, Harvey Mandel, Zakia Hooker, and the saxophonist Jules Broussard, who of course also played for uh, President Mary at her inauguration. Rick and his band, Laying Down the Law, are performing at Yoshi's Monday, November 21st, my friends, at 8 p.m. And here he is to give you a little taste. Rick, let's, let's get some. Oh yeah, you see, he was ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, hit it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. There he is, everybody. Rick Baskin. <laughs> thank you. Thank Rick you, Jason. Baskin. Thank you. Okay. So, Rick, thank you. And, Jason, thank you for that wonderful reintroduction of Rick with the uh, spectacular harmonica performance. But on the chat, I noticed a bunch of bell ringers for Rick. So, Ruth says, so glad to get to know Rick better. Thank you, Jason, for the great intro. Ring the bell for Rick and all he does for the community. And then Linda and Jim Bosnecker, ring the bell for Rick. And then Dudley Thompson, ring the bell for Rick. Joe Garaka, ring the bell for Rick. And I will also ring the bell for Rick. All right. Anybody else um, has ring the bell? Lorna. Lorna. Lorna Padilla. Okay. All right. So 
for the just to let you know ringing the bell is oh and rubber kit like to ring the bell so a ringing a bell is a $100 tax deductible deduct, uh, contribution to the open rotary endowment. So we appreciate your generosity and Rick, we're rooting for you. All right, thank you. So at this time, let's have some announcement. Mark Rosen, why don't you come tell us about the upcoming social event and how people can participate. Hi, I'm Mark Rosen, uh, and I'm here to tell you that Rotary of Oakland, number three, is going to the Bay Area Harmonica Convergence. I think I have a slide that's supposed to go up, and it's on November 21st at Yoshi's right downtown Oakland. And we, put, we have purchased, meaning we, Oakland Rotary, have 20 tickets that we purchased, general admission tickets, and they are $25 each limited number and you can purchase them on the Oakland Rotary website. And remember, these are general admission tickets. They don't guarantee you tick seating. So you have to get there at least an hour before, stand in line and pray for the best. Or you can have dinner at Yoshi's. Like I've made reservations at Yoshi's for six o'clock to have dinner. That entitles me with my general admission ticket to get a reserved seat. So remember, November 21st at Yoshi's. Tickets are $25. All the information is up on the Oakland Rotary website. Please go register, join us, and have a great time. Go, Rick. Okay, thank you. Um, we well, already got one ticket sold. Allison Bliss wants one ticket reserved, so 19 to go. Allison, please register online um, to, for your ticket. So make sure you guarantee one. Yeah, I, I actually checked the ticket sales and we've got, we're down to four people have already registered up there. So the tickets are going fast. Please make a reservation and join us for a fun evening. Okay. All right. Now, is it David Kirsten? Are you here to talk about another upcoming holiday event? Yes, President Mary. Thank you. I want to let everybody know that we are having a winter wonderland mixer on Thursday, December 8th. So this is a, the club's holiday party at the beautiful home of Fred and Allison Morse. Um, I'll put the link to register in the chat and we're gonna have um, drinks and hors d'oeuvres. There's gonna be multiple Santas there. Um, and um, we're also looking at possibly getting a, a snow machine um, to have some snow um, and the other holiday festivities, as well as a, some type of competition for, you know, a holiday outfit. So come dressed as Santa or some other holiday outfit. And we look forward to having everybody register for this uh, fun event. Yeah. Also, also wear your ugly sweater too. We may have an ugly sweater contest. Um, everybody have fun with the Halloween co costume contest. Let's try for a holiday costume contest. Yeah, we'll put some more details out on that um, as we get them. Okay, thank you, David. All right, at this point, let's uh, welcome Carrie Hamill, who will introduce today's speakers. And before she does that, if you have a question for our speaker, please put the question in the chat box and we will uh, ask those questions during the Q&A session. Take it away, Carrie. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Cheryl Cotton. Her formal title is she's the Deputy Superintendent of Public Instructions with the California Department of Education. She's a lifelong educator, former teacher and principal and grew up in the Bay Area, has done a lot of work there. She on the education specter has the hardest job because she is in charge of curriculum and assessment. And what that means is that she is responsible for what kids are being taught and how they are either succeeding or failing. So our president, Mary, has designated improving as education as one of our centerpiece goals this year. And all my kids graduated from Oakland Public Schools. I served for eight years on the Oakland School Board. 
And uh, like you, I'm very anxious today to hear from Ms. Cotton so that she can update us on how our public school students are doing. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate you. Um, if we can go ahead and share the slides. Excellent. And we can go to the next slide, please. Hold on, it's not letting me advance them. Uh -oh. I'm hoping you guys can't hear my dog. I put her upstairs in my room and she's just mad about it right now. <laughs> Okay, excellent. So good morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Cotton. I'm happy to be here on behalf of our state superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurmond. The superintendent has been an, ed an advocate for all students in California and works hard to ensure that all of California's 6 million students receive the quality education they deserve. You can see that he has led on this page, you can see that he has led many initiatives and worked to secure funds and support education across the state. You may not be aware that he commissioned actually an, an advisory group on focusing diversifying the teacher workforce, and he works diligently to address the shortage of teachers and classified staff. You can see that he's working hard to bring improvement to critical areas and initiatives. Uh, he has a special concentration on supporting our most underserved and vulnerable students and educators. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, my name is Cheryl Cotton. Uh, I am Deputy Superintendent of the Instruction, Measurement, and Administration Branch of the California Department of Education. My branch includes the Assessment Development and Administration Division. They administer, contract for, and seek state board authority for all matters pertaining to student assessments. Also the Curriculum Frameworks and Instructional Resources Division. They develop and monitor standards, frameworks, um, and curriculum. My branch also includes the Educator Excellence and Equity Division. They support educator professional learning and, and many grant programs. Um, something that may be of interest to this group is that division also facilitates our state seal of civic engagement, which honors our schools and students who participate in civic education programs and community service events. We also have members serving on the Power of Democracy Steering Committee from that uh, division. I also support our Office of Equal Opportunity, as well as our state special schools and diagnostic centers. I'm very proud of that. 2022-23 marks my 29th year in education. I actually started my teaching career in Oakland Unified School District as a first and second grade teacher and lived in Oakland for about nine years. Uh, I was born and raised in Richmond, attended El Cerrito High School, I went to UC Berkeley for undergrad, Mills College for my credential and my master's. So I am definitely a Bay Area uh, woman. I'm approaching my second year at CDE. So prior to coming to CDE, I was a county office and district administrator, a principal, an instructional coach with a nonprofit educational group and a classroom teacher. I'm happy to be here today and I look forward to sharing with you more of our statewide initiatives. Next slide, please. Today, we will briefly explore how the CDE is supporting California with initiatives such as universal pre-kindergarten, community schools, professional learning, anti-bias education, mental health programs, expanded learning programs, and universal meals to help with school transformation. There's always been a need for this transformation, but now more than ever, the need to transform schools for California students, employees, and families is prevalent. Next slide, please. So universal pre-kindergarten. We all know that learning starts at birth. Talking, reading, and singing, and playing with babies exposes them to language and supports healthy brain development. Supporting that learning and formalizing early learning for children in a school setting, particularly three and four-year-olds, 
who haven't had access to quality programs uh, and care sets them on a path for success. We're in the process of developing credentialing for preschool teachers to not only increase pay and access to leadership roles in education, but to provide alignment from pre-kindergarten through third grade. This is not about making pre-K look like kindergarten or first grade. As we've worked to align K through 12, we are now looking to developmentally align pre-kindergarten through third grade. So just think about it, transformation beginning with our youngest learners. Next slide, please. Community schools, it takes a village. The goals of community schools include enhancing community partnerships to support the school community. Building partnerships and supports enables children and families to access services. Examples of some critical services includes uh, access to before and after school extended learning opportunities, providing health care centers on campus so children don't have to leave school when they're ill or they need routine health care. This also works to reduce and address chronic absenteeism and improves health and safety. Also providing professional learning and collaboration time for educators is absolutely critical and demonstrates improvement in teacher retention. It takes a village, transforming whole communities. Next slide, please. Professional learning, supporting our teachers and mentors. We know that to recruit and retain great teachers, they must feel supported. Our state superintendent has said, in addition to assisting our students, we have much work to do to support our teachers and train and sustain our workforce. We're working with several, we're working with several initiatives to offer supports that are needed. The Golden State Teacher Grant Program, for example, is supporting teachers, um, teachers counselors, mental health staff with $20,000 that can be used to pay for their credentialing. We're investing in educator pipelines, grow your own programs like high school pathways where we have high schoolers learning about the field of education and, and careers in education. Teacher residency programs, providing an opportunity for those who are in credential programs to be paid to, to earn a living wage while they are training and preparing to become teachers, as well as classified to credential programs. So supporting those classified employees who maybe need to finish uh, their BA or have their BA and are ready to move forward. Oh, hi, Ahmad, that's a friend of mine. Uh, go Bears. <laughs> um, uh, these are all programs that we have, uh, that we're supporting right now uh, to support our uh, growing, our, our teachers, and addressing our teacher shortage. There are also funds available to support educator professional learning as well. Districts can braid funds to support these efforts using LCAP funds, as well as the $1.5 billion that have been set aside for educator effectiveness funds, $3.5 billion that have been set aside for arts, music, and instructional resources, discretionary block grant, and a new $8 billion that has been set aside by our state legislature to address learning recovery um, through a learning recovery emergency block grant. These all focus on, on supporting students, providing quality professional learning and recruitment and retention of educators. Um, both educators and those who work closely in schools, our classified staff, our paraprofessionals, um, our office staff, our bus drivers, all of those um, positions we're seeing a sharp decline in across the state. And we want to make sure that we're building up each person who's involved in schools knows that they are, are there to support our kids in, in a variety of ways. And we want to respect that and support that and encourage folks to come back to our education um, careers. Recently, one of our community partners, NextGen, has committed $1.4 million to support professional development for financial literacy. Recent legislation has also released funding for literacy coaches and reading specialists to support literacy instruction and to help get all California students reading by third grade. Funds are available to cover the costs of teachers who are interested in pursuing their national board certifications and then providing $5,000 each year for those folks who have those certifications um, to work in high priority schools. And we just completed actually this morning a webinar on uh, learning recovery um, and uh, talked about, again, expanded learning, talked about the use of those funds that have been set aside for schools, um, talked about data as well. So we're doing this work that 
Um, I think we had uh, 1,700 people signed up for that webinar uh, to be a part of that conversation and learn, get the, the supports that they are looking for to be able to impact their school communities. Transforming what support and learning opportunities look like across the state, that's transformative. Next slide, please. So anti-bias education. Promoting anti-bias education is an initiative that has uh, needed to be addressed for a long time. This initiative is designed to empower educators and students to confront hate, bigotry, racism, and bias that we're seeing rising in our communities across our state and our nation. CDE leads a series of strategies, including educator training grants, partnerships with community leaders, examination of policies, virtual classroom sessions that leverage the power of education to create a more just society. CDE has partnered with the National Equity Project to provide grants for districts to receive up to $200,000 to work towards making all public schools inclusive and supportive places. Through the practice of liberatory design, we seek to identify those educator activists whose viewpoints and teachings are based on the understanding that educational justice and racial justice are intertwined. The anti-bias education grant program applications, they've been extended and we are uh, looking at applications now, so excited um, for the, the interest um, and the need. And so really looking forward to moving this program forward. That is truly transformational. Next slide, please. Mental health support. A healthy mind is essential for learning. It absolutely is. COVID has impacted not only physical health, but our mental health and well being. The National Institutes of Health and the Department of Public Health have sounded the alarm with the need for mental health and wellness supports for students and school employees due to stressors related to the pandemic, related also to gun violence, racial injustice, and economic uncertainty. In response, our state superintendent is working to bring 10,000 more mental health professionals into our schools to assist our students by advocating for grants to help pay for pupil personnel credentials and stipulating trauma-informed professional development for our teachers, administrators, and classified staff in recent rounds of funding to schools. Transformative support beyond academics. Next slide, please. We are investing in before and after school options for children through our expanded learning opportunities program. We know that educational enrichment that is culturally responsive and extends the school day and school year positively impacts students and parents and helps encourage learning acceleration and mitigate against um, our need for learning recovery. Again, transforming what happens before, during and after the school day and school year, that is powerful. We talked a little bit this morning, someone raised the point of making sure that school is a joyful place for kids, that learning is fun and it's engaging. Um, that is something that we have to remember. This is not about remediating uh, education at this time. It's about finding out where our kids are and moving them forward from that point as quickly as we can and as thoroughly as we can, but again, it should not be a chore for kids. It should be something that is enjoyable, that is fun, um, that is social um, and supportive of their whole selves. So, next slide, please. Universal meals. And finally, we saw the impact um, that meals provided to our communities had on families that were dealing with food insecurities during the pandemic. Continuing to address the most basic needs of all students with a focus on those most vulnerable by providing breakfast, lunch, and supper is truly a sign of transformation in our schools. Next slide, please. So in addition to the priorities, um, our transforming schools priorities from our state superintendent, State Superintendent Thurman has also convened task forces to address black student achievement and statewide literacy by literacy campaign to get all third graders reading by third grade, no later than 2026. These groups pull together some of our best thinkers and leaders in academia, from the classroom, district folks and community organizations who are successfully supporting both African-American students, but also all students um, and recommending legislative changes 
to directly impact student achievement and to form guidance to the field that promotes quality literacy and in instruction. Thank you to everyone who has been part of that conversation. This is unprecedented, powerful, and transformative. Next slide, please. Additional priorities for our state superintendent and Department of Education is to address the most important needs across our state. Two areas of immediate importance is, again, we've talked about this before, the recruitment and retention of teachers and school staff, and also the urgent need to address learning acceleration and recovery and close the achievement gap once and for all. Next slide, please. I appreciate the invitation to speak with you today. I, I hope the information that I shared is helpful in understanding our state superintendent's priorities and, and some of the work that's happening at the California Department of Education in support of students across California. Are there any questions? I wanted to say thank you to Cheryl as a fellow Rotarian for uh, stepping in and uh, coming to speak. Um, thanks, Ruth, for uh, inviting us to come and attend today. So thank you, Cheryl. I know you had a busy morning today, so really, really appreciate you coming <laughs> to Rotary. Thank today. you, Abel. I appreciate that. And thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate that. That just means that I was. this was a thorough presentation, that everyone completely mm -hmm. understood what was happening. <laughs> Um, but I do encourage you, if you do have questions about what's happening in schools, oh, Dudley, I see your hand. If you see, have questions about what's happening in schools, don't hesitate. A bell is here. I'm available. Reach out to us if you have those questions. Dudley, what's your question? You had in one of those last slides, you talked about achieving, um, you know, uh, was it third grade? It was kind of one of the real. Mm -hmm. Liter focus, literacy by third grade. Focus levels. Reading. And, and I know that you know, Oakland in particular really gets looked at in mm -hmm. terms of, um, I'm going to say low achievement at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, you know, it's one thing to kind of put in a PowerPoint, but I mean, how do you, that's tough to get at. How do you, can you talk it, about that more? It is a challenge. I just want to highlight and lift up Oakland a little bit though. Oakland Unified School District, um, our data was released. So our um, English language arts and math data and science data, as well as um, information about our English learners and how they were doing last year for 21-22. That data was released um, a couple weeks ago. Oakland Unified School District actually made a gain where most places had losses. Um, I, Oakland is doing some things that are right. And I, I, as a former teacher of Oakland, that was back in the 90s though, but being in the Bay Area, I know that they're doing some good things as well. Um, how do we address that? We address it in the classroom. We address it with supports for teachers. We address it um, and different communities are doing different things to address literacy. We are a local control state. What that means is that we as CDE provide guidance. Um, we provide support, we provide recommendations, we provide materials, we provide all that information and encourage folks to, to go back to their communities and do what's best for their communities. Um, you may see in some communities that they hire more paraprofessionals. They have multiple adults in the classroom able to do small groups. There are communities that are really focusing on internships. And so really building up that the, the teacher population, those folks who are interested in becoming teachers, but also providing small group instruction and, and support for students. Um, we're working on hiring actually a literacy director for the state. So someone who can kind of pull together all, all of these resources that we have going. We have some organizations that are doing excellent work for both literacy and biliteracy in our schools um, and in our communities, pulling all of this work together, pulling all of these funding, these funding streams together to be able to support our our most vulnerable kids, our kids who may not, without these supports, be reading at third grade. That's the work that we're doing right now. We're pulling together um, leaders, both in academia as well as from the classroom, who are doing this work. We've hired and set aside $250 million for literacy coaches and reading specialists for schools. 
uh, to work with kinder through third grade students um, and also provide professional development. So professional learning for those coaches and specialists as well as educators who are working with students. So we're trying to approach it in multiple ways um, to address um, and get kids reading by third grade. Hi, hi Mary. Uh, my name hi. is Peter Sheriff. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I've been having a internet issue and it kicked me out again, so I had to come back in. So thank you for filling in for me. Uh, any more questions for uh, Ms. Cotton? Yeah, I, I had a question, Peter Sheriff. Yes. Uh, I would like, I don't know if you know, but the Rotary Club of Oakland has been supporting uh, transitional kindergarten classrooms in Oakland Unified School District for a decade. I didn't know that. That's as, exciting. We've, yes. we've supported as many as almost, I think, 20 or 22 classrooms with field trips and books and awesome. uh, uh, materials. In fact, when it was started, when transitional kindergarten was started, we mm -hmm. actually provided most of the supplies for the classrooms, the six classrooms, I think, at the time. So anyway, Excellent. what I'd like to know is, uh, is the funding for pre kindergarten education is that now solid i know that it was somewhat dependent because the budget happened to be in good shape but is that really now going to be continuing budgeting for those pre kindergarten students as far as i'm aware that's not specifically in the work that i do but as far as i'm aware yes it is um we are gearing up for uh universal pre-k as well as universal tk so where you've seen pockets of tk tk will be available across the board and be funded the way that it needs to be. Um, hearing that, you know, you provided those those supports um, as TK was getting started 10 years ago. Um, please continue to support, but also the state is providing those 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 financial supports for pre universal pre-K and TK. We're also working on um, we're also working on creating the credential for pre preschool through third grade teachers. This is a new type of a credential. Um, I think it's exciting because it allows our preschool teachers tend to be the lowest paid. It allows them to have access to um, normal credential, the credentialing that we do for our multiple subject and our single subject and our special education teachers allows them to, to land on a salary schedule that allows them to move forward in their career. They can move into leadership roles and positions within school districts as well. So it is, it's, it's definitely life-changing. Um, we're looking for, thank you, Abel, we're looking for probably 14,000 more teachers to support this, this work. And so that's our biggest challenge um, in terms of figuring out. So if you know of anyone who's interested in teaching, please, it, um, send them to their their district. Send them to me. We can talk through what they need to do to become a teacher. Um, our Cal our California Commission on Teacher Credentialing also has supports that they're able to provide and counseling that they're able to provide for folks who are interested in the teaching profession. So, if any of you are interested in uh, working in in classrooms, let us know. Robert, okay. I see your hand. Yes. Okay. We have one last question from Robert Kidd. Uh, Ms. Cotton, thanks again for, for uh, uh, joining us today. Um, I understand that uh, uh, in school boards across the nation, uh, school boards have become battlegrounds for culture wars. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand even some uh, counties in uh, northern and uh, northeastern California, uh, you see your stories of that, that that are focused on curriculum and so on. And so my question is, what what the super does the superintendent have a role in any of that? Uh, and if if so, what 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 what's his um, what's his take on that? The challenge is, and as I I described earlier, we are a local control state, which means that our our governing school boards within each community are making decisions for our for their communities. Um, the challenge is that if those decisions are not um, fair and just for students or for staff, then it becomes a problem. These shifts are starting now. Um, 
I'm not sure if the superintendent has addressed anything directly, um, but I know that he is very much aware of what's going on in our communities. Um, he makes himself available if there are issues that parents have or concerns that they that that come up. He makes himself available. He puts himself in those communities and really works to try to resolve issues. Um, that's that's the role that our superintendent is playing. Um, he will roll up his sleeves and say what's happening here. There are other organizations that we also can work with to support CSBA or California School Boards Association um, is one that we can partner with to address some of these issues. Um, if that helps to answer your question, but our superintendent is very much will roll up his sleeves, go to that community and support. I'm very excited as well, Ruth. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl, for that wonderful presentation. As you, you know, Mary. education is my focus for my year. And awesome. I would, and the Rotary Club of Oakland is proud to partner with Oakland Promise to offer eight ten thousand dollars scholarship annually, along with mentorship. We are proud to support many as the first in their family to do to attend college. In recognition of your presentation today, Oakland Road will make a donation in your name to the Oakland Promise to support its kindergarten to college program for every child in our city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is, that is a, a wonderful gift and I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Joe Garaka. November is the Rotary Foundation Month. And every week we learn something new from you. What do you have in store for us today? President uh, Mary. And first off, I want to thank everyone in the room and all the Oakland Rotarians for their generous donations to the Rotary Foundation last year. And I ask you please to participate this year. So we meet President Mary's participation goal. And as Mary says, it's tax deductible. Check your mailbox tonight, tomorrow. You should have a surprise from the Rotary Foundation Committee, a glossy flyer along with pledge forms to use to donate. New this year, take advantage of the rewards program, matching points. All donations up to $500 will be matched, making it easier to become a Paul Harris Fellow or the next level up. Let's say you donated $300 in the past. You would normally need to donate another $700 to become a Polaris Fellow at $1,000. But with matching points, you now only need to donate $350. I joined Rotary 40 years ago. Yes, I'm a very old part. At 28 back then, I could barely afford $50 donations, but made them to be part of the club's efforts. Three years later, after serving as the third president of the San Ramon Rotary Club, the club honored me by completing my Paulos Fellow with of all things matching points. Now I'm hooked. Continue supporting the Rotary Foundation and repart to repay this honor. I believe the Rotary Foundation does so much, is able to accomplish so much more as the Rotary Foundation utilizes Rotarians' free labor and expertise. So no donation is too small, $25 is the minimum. Participation is what counts. In any event, this year, this is the year to get double credit for your donations via points credited to your TRF account. But be careful, you may become hooked too. Peter Sheriff now will give us an example of how your donations are used. Peter has overseen several large grants that included multiple individuals and clubs. He is an expert at maximizing the doing good return on your donations. Then Celeste will let us know why she supports the TRF Rotary Foundation. Peter? All right, thank you very much. Well, one of the joys of belonging to the Oakland Rotary Club is to be able to participate in developing, planning, funding, and, uh, and implementing really very powerful and impactful projects. Uh, and the one that I'm currently working on is a WASH project. That stands for Water and Sanitation and Hand Washing for two primary schools in Homa Bay, Kenya. The kinds of problems that we're addressing are that water is just not available 
here is a typical picture of people getting their, their uh, domestic water out of a stream. And these two young ladies are off carrying water because women in these societies often are the water carriers. And these, you'll notice one of them's wearing a backpack. And that backpack is because she's also going to school. In fact, the two schools that we are going to be helping, the students every day have to take their jugs and go off and find water, fill them up so that they actually have the water that they can drink and use to, washing, and use to wash their hands uh, every day. And this interferes with their studies. It, it places uh, the young people in some uh, less than safe situations. And it makes them tired and it interferes with their ability to study. We also found when we visited these schools, when they were asking us to put in the wells, we discovered that their toilet facilities, these two toilets serve 600 kids. And they look like this. And in fact, the community that we, met, we uh, were talking to were extremely worried about these toilets because in a school just down the road, one of these uh, toilet facilities collapsed and a young boy drowned. The plan is to drill two boreholes. Uh, these, will be, uh, oper uh, these will be operated by solar pumps. The, the pumps will pump the water up to a water tower, which will pressurize it. And then inside the school grounds, there will be uh, faucets for the kids to use. This is a, uh, it's really a good idea to put these wells into schools because the schools have security. And uh, they have 24-7, 365 uh, security guards. And so we know that the, the mechanical systems will be safe. But it's not only just for the 1,500 students in these two schools. We're also planning to put in these ATM-like water kiosks where people will be able to take their mobile phones. And mobile phone banking in Kenya is absolutely ubiquitous. Every family has access to a mobile phone. They'll be able to take their phone. They'll be able to scan it. They'll be able to get the water out of the kiosk. And it's going to be that money that will be gathered in a secure and safe way uh, that will be used to maintain the system. Uh, Joe also asked me to talk about the fact that this year, for the first time, we are actually trying to raise money uh, on a GoFundMe page. And this is not intended for members of this Rotary Club to donate here. You, you, we want you to donate to the Rotary Foundation and to the uh, Rotary Endowment in the spring. But you'll notice that this comes to seven, $7,125 have been raised. And most of that has been because people Friends of mine, myself, a few other people have been sharing this page. And I put in the chat the, um, the uh, uh, URL, and I'd love for members of this club to actually click on that URL and share this page to, their, uh, to your own uh, Facebook pages. Because every time I do that, I end up with another $1,000. I, uh, I did it with Karen here about a week ago. And we went from around $6,100 to $7,100. So please, we're asking everybody to go ahead, either use this QR code or click on the link in the chat, share this page to your uh, Facebook page, and hopefully we'll be able to raise the additional $36,000 that we need to do this project. Celeste, I think it's your turn. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? <laughs> um, so I'm uh, just, I'll keep it really, really brief. And just to let everyone know, um, one of the reasons I give is the idea of exponential impact for your dollars donated. And why do I say that? Because when we give money, and those donations are matched by the district. So we're really able to have even more impact um, than if you were just giving you know, you, that particular amount. Um, another reason is because another idea about exponential impact has to do with um, many of these projects are involving other districts, other clubs, other nonprofits. So it's a way for us to really, again, come together rally around a project and have greater impact. Um, it's also a way to directly support and influence 
um, where we want to place our intentions in our club and with our global um, grant committee. So that's what all I have to say about that. Um, it's a really great way to maximize your donation. And I would like to join, ask you to join me in a compounded social return. And I'm offering $100 donation right now. And I ask you to follow me in that. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you, Joe and Peter, for that wonderful TRF campaign rollout. And stay tuned for some more next week and next month. So it will be on your top of your head. And remember, for TRF. OK, so now we're going to go do some Mary's fun facts. OK, and I'm going to has to add, Lorna, are you still Lorna Marcus Badia? If not, can I ask Jim Bosenecker to work help me with this fun fact? Yes, I'm oh. here, Mary. Lorna, OK, good. You and Jim, take it away. OK, so I. So you want to ready? You, Yes, go ahead. I need to okay. get on the screen. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Did you know that today is International Accountants Day? I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yes, Lorna. Today, every accountant in the world celebrates the great work accountants do to make businesses thrive, support the economy, and help people navigate the complexities of finance. Yeah, I know every Oakland Rotary member looks forward to International Accountants Day, right? Actually, accountants are known for more than just their knowledge of the tax codes, Laura. Right? Yeah, did you know the FBI employs over 2,000 accountants? I'm sure every hardened criminal throws up their hands and surrenders when they see one of those FBI accountants approaching with their briefcase. Well, not only that, it was an accountant who brought down Chicago crime boss Al Capone he wasn't convicted of murder or racketeering. He was conv convicted of tax fraud due to the forensic accounting efforts by Special Agent Frank Wilson. Yes, Lorna, there are many famous accountants. Both Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones and Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin were pursuing accounting degrees before their music careers took off. And Ray Worthing, the kicker for the 49ers from 1977 to 1987, was a CPA. Well, at least they had a backup career if the music business or NFL didn't work out. That's for sure. Speaking of famous people, accountants play an important role in the annual Oscar ceremony. Accountants spend hours counting the Academy Award ballots by hand. Yeah, wait a minute. Didn't an accountant get fired for handing the wrong Best Picture envelope to Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway in 2017? Well... Maybe we shouldn't celebrate that event. Yeah, moving on. There are many words in the English language that have two consecutive sets of double letters. But thanks to accountants, there is only one English word with three consecutive sets of double letters. Anybody in the audience know the answer? That's right. Yes. Keeper. <laughs> Who had it? Well, we're gonna leave you with one final accounting accomplishment. An accountant invented a process used by millions of people all over the world. Walter Deemer, an accountant for the Fleer Chewing Gum Company invented pink bubble gum. The gum was pink because that was the only food coloring the factory had available. Happy, so, happy well, International, International Accountants Day. Accountants Day. <laughs> all right. In honor of Mary. Well, thank you. Go Mary. That was, that was some nice fun facts. So I would like to get big thanks to Lorna and Jim for sharing the accountant fun facts and humor in today's skit uh, in recognition of International Accountant Day. And could you pull up that slide one more time? And on behalf of Rotary Accountants Worldwide, I invite you to all embrace the accounting accountant model be audit that you can be. And also, we also want to recognize um, if we can get that, that slide, good. So there's the pink bubble gum that was invented by accountant and November 10th is International Accountant. And I didn't know until 
um, trivial master Michael Brook brought it to my attention. So the question is for all you guys to think, how's account made a difference in your life? November 10th is the time to pat your accountant on the back, okay, and recognize the vital role in your company. As I said, the audit you can be is our motto. And Rotarians are accountants, and I look them up in a roster that could identify as accounting or tax. Um, so if I didn't recognize you this time, please put in a chat so I'll be sure to recognize you next year. But we have uh, Treasurer Lorna uh, Badia, Badia, Marcus Badia, Badia Marcus. We have District uh, uh, Treasurer Joe Garaka. We have Jim Bosnecker. We have Oakland City Auditor Courtney Ruby. We have Keith Jaron, Rod Hughes, Charlie Adams, Vivian Chan, Jacqueline Forster. So if you're not recognized here, put it in the chat and I'll recognize you next year. How's that? Thank you. All right. At this point, can I call on Robert Kidd to tell us who's our next week's speaker? Be my pleasure, President Mary. Uh, I had no idea that that uh, that accountants were so important and and so important in my personal life. So I think uh, perhaps we should look for a, a speaker in the future about the importance of of uh, historical uh, accountant figures. In the meantime, in the meantime, Mary, I know you've had this question in your mind from time to time, and that is when is a touchdown a touchdown? I know that it, uh, every Sunday afternoon you're, you're glued to the television watching National Football League games. Our speaker next week is Mike Pereira, a longtime referee, and for the last 12 years, he's been the guy that's consulted, even during football games, about the application of the esoteric corners of rules of football. He will be speaking to us next week here at Rotary Club of Oakland. And even if you hate, even if you hate football, here's your opportunity to have your horizons expanded to, to this important, uh, important uh, um, uh, field, very closely related uh, to, to the rules of accountancy. So next week, Mike Pereira here at Rotary Club of Oakland. Okay, thank you, uh, Robert. All right, I'd like to thank everyone who participated in today's meeting. And next week, we will resume our hybrid meeting in the ballroom. So share, share, which means thank you, everyone. This meeting is adjourned.